When we had our last fight, words were said out of line. They were your words, not mine. Do you ever look back and think about all the things you could have said? Replay them over again inside your head. This is the Revisionary Podcast. Stories of all we would have done in the past. This is the Revisionary Podcast with your host, Juan Carlos. The Revisionary Podcast. Hello and welcome, 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 welcome to another episode of the Revisionary Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Juan Carlos. So if this is the first time you've ever listened to the Revisionary Podcast, the way this works is we bring on guests who tell nonfiction stories about their lives in which they wish things had gone a little bit differently. Afterwards, I give them an opportunity to retell the same exact story, except this time they can change any facts or details that they want about the story. And then we go ahead and discuss the impact of the changes that they've made. Um, before we get started today, I actually have an announcement to make for those of you guys who are listening. I'm sure a lot of you guys are still full from Thanksgiving. I hope you guys had a safe and wonderful Thanksgiving and made the best of it given uh, the current conditions of our country and uh, on quite honestly this world. But um, before we get started, I'd like to announce that uh, the last Instagram live episode went so well that we've decided that we're going to do another one. Um, this time we have uh, Gastro Almonte coming back to uh, join us on Instagram Live. That it, this time it will be on the Revisionary Podcast Instagram Live. Uh, it'll be on December nineteenth at one p.m. Eastern. So you can adjust for your own time zones. I believe that's one p.m. Eastern, and I think if my math is correct, that is ten a.m. Pacific time or West Coast time. This should be a lot of fun. Please feel free to join us and uh, ask Gaster questions because this story had a lot to impact, if you remember correctly. So if you haven't already, go back and listen to Gaster's episodes. Uh, they're wonderful. And uh, if you have, please come on, ask him questions, talk to him, get to know Gaster because it's a tremendous opportunity to ask all the questions that I didn't have an opportunity to think of while I was recording the episode with him. Um, also, this week, I'm very excited to announce that we have Jacob Williams joining us, and uh, I'm really excited for this episode because uh, for those of you guys who don't know Jacob, Jacob is a, he's an actor, he's a comedian, he kind of does a lot of different things and takes on a lot of different projects, um, but his two claims to fame are that he's been on America's Got Talent, and also he is one of the uh, cast members of uh, the hit t- MTV show Wild and Out. Which is huge for me. Like, I'm really excited that I have an opportunity to speak to Jacob today because I remember as a kid, like in high school, I would watch Wild and Out and I would try to reenact all the games with some of my friends and, you know, do a lot of the stuff. Like, I like my personal favorite is the rap battle at the end. Like, I think that that's hilarious. And it's really cool to be able to have the opportunity to have a conversation with someone who's had the opportunity to play these games live on TV. So I'm really excited for this call and I won't even dilly dally. Let's go ahead and uh, see if we can get Jacob on the line. Hey Jacob, how are you? Oh, good. How's it going? Good to see you. Oh, it's going great. I'm so happy that you've decided to come and tell us your story today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's always good to see you. No, of course. So, you know, what have you been up to? Well, I am releasing a like a comedy album and special that I taped last year. I'm really excited about that. So by the time people are seeing this, it might be out now. But basically, um, yeah, I shot like an hour long album and kind of produced the, the video for it for a comedy special with a few camera angles and stuff. And that's all edited together so that I think the full special is up on my Patreon page, like patreon.com slash MR Jacob Williams. And then um, by the time people hear this, the album is hopefully out there on like iTunes and Spotify and Pandora and wherever people listen to those. And so that's kind of like some of my favorite jokes from um, my first 12, 13 years of doing comedy. And uh, so I'm super excited about that. And um, I really appreciate all the the messages and comments I've been getting so far from the stuff I've posted and the people that have started watching it on Patreon and everything. So very, very happy about that. And uh, so now I've, I've just been kind of working on new jokes and uh, at the moment doing a lot of like online and outdoor shows and mostly in anywhere I can perform that's safe. It's good to just uh, get in front of audiences again. So that's been really fun. 
You know, it's 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 interesting because I was one of the lucky people. I had the pleasure of watching you in Yonkers at, Co- at Yonkers Comedy Club when you were working. Oh, that was so fun. Material. And yeah, I can, I can attest that like that. I mean, you you were funny that night. You were just crushing left and right. So I'm really excited to finally hear the album and hear the final you know masterpiece once it's put together. Wow, thank you. That was such a fun show, and I appreciate you having me on that. And it was so fun to like do a longer set in front of such a great audience. I think it was when my mom was actually visiting New York, so it was fun to have like bring her to that show and her to get to see like a lot of great comics and have this great crowd to perform in front of. So, um, yeah, that was great. That was such a good experience. Yeah, no, anytime. So, you know, let's. Why don't we uh, go ahead and jump into this, uh, Jacob? I'm going to hand you the stage. Why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us your story? I was thinking about this because uh, I think the idea was like to talk about um, things we regret, and um, I don't have any regrets. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but <laughs> uh, no, I, I feel like I regret stuff like every day, all the time. So there was like it was kind of hard to narrow it down to just one story, I guess. But I thought about um, a few things, and uh, I guess like one of my like regrets, like earlier in the doing stand up, was. Um, uh, involved kind of, um, like my last, uh, my last appearance on, um, when I did America's Got Talent, I felt like, uh, I did really badly. And so, uh, um, I think, um, that kind of like haunted me for a while in my head, at least. If you don't and mind so, me asking, I'm, I'm so sorry. If, oh, you go ahead. if you don't mind me asking when you say like badly, right. Uh, because we have a, di- a diverse audience. Why don't you explain what performing badly in your opinion is? Sure, sure. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because uh, I've done so many types of shows now and like, I've done a lot of shows where it went badly, but it, it wasn't necessarily my fault or completely my fault with, you know, there's, I have a lot of stories about like, and some of them are on my special and album about just like shows that went wrong and were just not set up well for comedy. But, um, and there was maybe some of that at play here but um but i guess in this case like i felt like um when i was in the semi-finals i think it was like my first time on that show and i think it was about five years into doing comedy i felt like i just didn't perform as well as i wanted in terms of like being in the moment and that kind of thing so it felt like i um i think i got in my head a little bit i got nervous even though i'd already done three sets on the show at that point but in general, that was my first TV appearance and I'd used up some of my favorite jokes and stuff. So I think I like, once I got out there and the crowd wasn't like as, uh, you know, receptive as I thought there would be or whatever it was, um, I think it, it like threw me a little bit and I kind of like rushed through it and was kind of embarrassed about how I delivered it in like not the most confident way and that kind of thing. And so um, I think I've looked back at it and um, I'm definitely like, it's not a set I'm proud of. And um, But at the time, I think I took it especially hard and regretted it to an extreme degree at the time where I felt like I had to quit comedy or like my career was <laughs> over or something. <laughs> like This was in 2012 and uh, I was about five years into comedy. I was 23 at the time. But um, but yeah, basically, I, I just uh, was kind of really hard on myself about it. Um, and in some ways, I still, um, yeah, I've still gotten like annoyed since then. Sometimes it'd be like, oh, I guess that's like still one of the mo- the first clips that comes up if people look me up because uh, you know it's a popular show and it has right a lot of views. And uh, so it's just uh, it just felt like kind of annoying to work on comedy for a few years, like, and then uh, have like one of my most well. I mean, most documented or well, well viewed clips be like me not doing that well, but uh, but now I mean I don't really care so much about it at the moment as of I course. do. You've had other successes. Oh, thanks. I I don't know. I try, but uh, but yeah. So um, but yeah, it was interesting. It was like um, yeah, because overall that was um a very bittersweet experience because like the the my first time on the show I felt really proud of in terms of how I performed and how the, and then I got lucky that the crowd and judges were really nice and they ended up like giving me a standing ovation and stuff, which was like kind of blew me away. I was like really just doing mostly a lot of open mics to that point and stuff. And I had been doing comedy five years, but I mean, I'd been in college for a lot of that time. Right. Um, I started when I was 18 and I was going to college in Wisconsin um, in the middle of nowhere. So the only times I could get on stage for some of that, a lot of that time was like, 
like a open mic in a coffee shop on campus every like every two weeks and right. I'd be like the only comedian. <laughs> um, and so then, um, by then I'd started like, um, I was in Chicago for a little bit and I was able to get more stage time and stuff. And so I think I just felt like so desperate for like any kind of, uh, like credibility or whatever. So I think I like sent them a video and got on the show maybe, um, partly from my comedy. I'm assuming a lot of it might've also been just from being like, kind of like a nerdy or weird guy. Like I think a lot of that kind of reality show thing is like right. choosing, uh, you know, certain archetypes or like types of personalities they want. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but, but yeah, I remember the first time I did it, I was really nervous and definitely, uh, concerned. And so, um, I ended up, um, I, d- filming it in St. Louis and, um, I lived in Chicago and I didn't really know a lot of people there. So right. I was really worried about like not being able to, um, get on stage the night before and like practice the material, uh, which I always felt was important, even though I'd never done TV, but I got the sense like you should like do that. And so what I ended up doing was just like walking around St. Louis, like downtown by the arch and all these places. And I would, I was so shy and stuff too, but I was so um, scared of doing badly in the audition that I literally just would go up to anyone I saw on the street and just be like, Hey, like, uh, I'm auditioning for America's Got Talent tomorrow. Like I'm going to do 90 seconds of jokes. Like, and you know, I wanted to test it out on little people cause it's like comedy. Like you have to know if you get a sense of the timing with an audience there. And so is it cool if I like run some jokes past you? You know, it's funny you say that because when I was younger, like especially like my freshman year of of, uh, of college, I, I, I mean, I was also painfully shy. And yeah. that's how I tried uh, to talking to women at first. I would go to the mall and, you know, and I'd made it a point to approach them and do similar things like, hey, can I talk to you for 90 seconds to get over the shyness? So it's interesting that you were using that for comedy. Oh, that's really interesting because I'm actually, I still haven't learned how to talk to women. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I'm still learning. I might have to, yeah, no, that's actually way more impressive than me because I still don't feel capable of that. And that's still something I'm really shy about. But but in that moment, and I, yeah, and since then, I, I don't think I've done anything like this. But yeah, just in terms of getting ready for that stand up set, I was, right. I, I like my fear or desperation or want or like really wanting to do well kind of pushed me to do that so yeah it was, it was kind of awkward because i was just like hey can i try these jokes on you and like i think everyone just said no for the most part right. um and i was like okay yeah that makes sense there's just a stranger asking you to tell jokes at night it's kind of weird um on the street <laughs> um but then i think there was like uh one person i asked ended up being like he was like outside of a bar i think he was like a security guard so he just like had to be there right so uh I don't know if he was like enthusiastic about it, but he literally had nothing else. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what he said, but he basically let me say jokes at him. Um, and I think he just stared at me without reacting. And, <laughs> uh, and he's like, all right, uh, good luck. And it seemed like he could, he was like, all right, this guy's not going to do well on the show. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, um, I don't know if that helped my confidence. Uh, I I do think it it weirdly did in the sense that I was like, okay, if I can like hold my composure while just saying it to like bombing in front of one person, then right. ho- hopefully the real crowd won't be as bad. But I was nervous, and uh, you know, there was like I know people sometimes get booed on there, or they get like extra or heckled, or or people are like are yelling at them and stuff. So, um, so I think I went to like, there was like another similar thing where there was another security guy and he like tolerated listening to it. And then I think there were a couple of people smoking outside a hotel Uh and they also didn't seem that into it, but like they let me say jokes and I was like timing this on like a little stopwatch thing. And, uh, so I think all those people thought I was like a a psychopath or something, but, um, were you getting big reactions for these people when you were speaking with them? No, not at all. I got, um, uh, like no reaction, um, except maybe, um, looking at me with annoyance and that I was even telling them jokes. Do you think that they believed you that you were going on America's Got Talent or did they like, that's what I'm trying to figure out too. Yeah, I don't know for sure. There's no way to really know, I guess. Um, I think they either, they might've easily not believed me or if they believed me, they might have just not cared because uh, or not wanted to be bothered, which I totally understand. I would get probably annoyed if 
if I was walking around and someone <laughs> like, even though, and I'm a comedian, I love comedy, but I wouldn't want it. If someone just came up to me and asked to tell me jokes, I'd probably say no, but, um, but yeah, but weirdly, and then I think I also ran it past a, a friend from college that night over the phone and then also by over his mom and she gave me a really good note um, over the phone of like just kind of slowing down in the beginning and taking my time, which I think is important. And so by the time I did it the next day, it was like, I think it went well partly because I was, um, I was so, you know, really wanting it to go well, but I also, um, I guess, cause I I'd prepared in those, like, those were like kind of the toughest audiences, which is like just one person trying to make one stranger laugh on the street or something. So I felt good about the first one. Yeah. And then I think the second round was like, that one was kind of weird cause there was no audience and this was way before the pandemic and stuff. This was 2012, but for some reason they did a round that was in Vegas without a crowd and just the judges. Right. Which is kind of weird as a comedian. Cause it's like, you know, you want an audience there. Um, and then I, I felt like I kind of regret like maybe using up some of my best, like I, I had a lot of like one liners that I would normally spread throughout like a half hour, hour set at the time. And uh, I ended up like, I feel like burning a lot of those and like just trying to get to the next round. And then they didn't even air a lot of it. Was that? And so then my third round, um, I think that was like shot live. Um, well, it was a combination. Yeah, I actually thought like, oh, I should do some some stuff that I think is solid that's not necessarily my favorite crowd-pleasing things because it's probably going to get edited out based on what I saw. But then I talked to like, I think one of the producers and she's like, oh no, don't hold back. You got to get to the next level. And I was like, okay, I guess she's on the show. So she knows. So I kind of took her advice there. Wait, and did you like, were you not allowed to repeat sets once you had told the joke? Um, yeah, you're not allowed to repeat sets, uh, which was annoying in the sense that, um, a lot of the jokes I said hadn't even aired. Like, so some of my best stuff ended up not even airing. Right. Um, like I might've even performed better in my second round than my first round, but it's kind of hard to tell because they edited a lot of it out and there was no audience reaction. So, um, so I felt like that was another thing I regretted a little bit at the time. But yeah, I think the th- the third round, um, I was definitely nervous about, but that ended up going pretty well. And that was like in front of a real crowd in um, Newark, New Jersey, um, at the the NJ, the Performing Arts Center there. Right. And that was cool. Um, I think it was another thing where I like um, ran it past my friend on the phone and was maybe able to do like open mic type stuff or some guest spot type stuff and around New York to work on it a little bit. And so I felt pretty good. Um, but, uh, but then I think there was like a long gap before the fourth time doing that show, uh, the semifinals, I guess at that point, um, I think because of the Olympics and different things. And I'd actually scheduled, um, before I knew I was going to be doing the show that year, um, I had scheduled like a trip with my parents to go to India so um i ended up going there like in between the third and fourth round for like two oh. weeks did that throw which, you off? uh which uh, yeah i don't know i don't know if that necessarily helped because it was uh a time when i would have liked to be and i i felt a little anxious about it even then because i was like well i'm gonna be like uh trying to get ready for the next round of this tv show that's really competitive and like i mean it's amazing to like get to go to india like it was very beautiful and we had some some wonderful family friends there and it was great to like spend that time with my parents and sightseeing but at the same time i felt a little anxious the whole time about like for stand-up you know especially when leading up to something like a national on tv comedy thing like uh you kind of want to like be doing it every night in front of it. I wish it was more like an instrument where you could just practice, you know, sometimes I wish that where you could just practice in a room wherever, right. but, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that was still a great experience in its own way. And then, um, I, uh, was able to, uh, do a lot of sets, uh, leading up to the fourth round when I got back for like a week or two. And so I think I had like a bunch of shows in like, Vegas where I um I opened for Louis Anderson for a couple of weeks at like a small theater there and that was really fun and then overlapping one of the weeks I did like seven nights of two shows a night at this other place and so it was definitely nice to be able to 
have a lot of stage time. And then actually when I got to New York, I ended up doing, I think like 23 sets in like six days, like leading up to the last taping. So yeah, so it was like a weird thing where um, uh, my last round, um, I think it ended up not going how I wanted, which was just kind of ironic because every time I'd done the set that week, it had gone better than the time on TV. And so, uh, so it was just kind of a learning experience in terms of like, I think sometimes it's good to prepare in like maybe some of the toughest circumstances before like a big opportunity, as opposed to like, if you're preparing in like these kind of with easier crowds or like overly generous crowds, it might give you like a false sense of security in the material or whatever, where you might be thrown off once, you know, something is tough in the actual situation. Um, And then, um, yeah, it was also always interesting on that show for me, how um, I think it was edited where like my first round, um, they kind of encouraged me to do this stuff in my interview that made it look like I'd never done comedy. And so it it looks like, like, um, I think some of it's on YouTube, but yeah, it was basically like me saying things like, um, like I really want to be a comedian. Like I'm really shy. I'm like afraid of talking to people, which is true. But, right. but the way it was kind of edited and played up, it was almost like this guy is like described as like a real estate agent, which was like a part-time job I had at the time. Who wanted <laughs> to have a comedy. So I think for the audience watching, it was probably like, Oh, this guy is like, maybe just to make it seem unexpected that I did well. Um, and stuff. And then on like my last round, um, there was like kind of a weird intro package to my set where it was like, uh, I think they just showed some of my most awkward, uh, moments. And like, there was a thing of me saying like, I like to drink, I drink water when I'm nervous or something like that. And then it like cut to like a shot me drinking water, which (laughs) I didn't know was going to be necessarily a part of the broadcast part of the interview. I was just getting ready for the interview at that time, but I guess I was on camera. Um, that was for like an interview, uh, for like the lead in package, but I mean, they hadn't asked any questions yet. I think I was just drinking some water, um, to, you know, drink water, which I like to do. Um, I have some right now, but, uh, (laughs) but yeah, so, uh, it was just like, there was just some interesting editing choices. So, uh, but I, you know, I was 23. I, I'm sure, I, like, maybe I had pissed off an editor or something. I don't know what happened exactly, but uh, I'm sure I was like kind of annoying at the time, anyway. Um, so I, I definitely felt in over my head with that experience. But um, I, at the same time, I guess I learned a lot from it, and um, I think it did help lead to other things like working with MTV and um, doing comedy full time. Actually, so it was like a very bittersweet experience where it did help me a lot in a lot of ways and I learned so much but I was like after that last uh appearance on there I felt like so uh depressed about how I'd done that I I was like ended up like just staying inside a lot for like two weeks and just like I think I was like drinking a lot of whiskey and like (laughs) just like thinking about quitting comedy and like binge watching Mad Men and uh just not you know, feeling like I have to quit comedy, like this is so embarrassing. And I didn't, I didn't really realize how much it really doesn't matter how any one thing goes. Um, I mean, yeah, it's just great to always do your best, but I've learned since then. It's like, I've had so many disappointments since then. And I realized like, yeah, like sometimes things don't work out, but you can still, um, you know, there's always a, like, or pretty much always a chance to learn something and move on or try other things. There's always going to be other opportunities out there. So Let, let's back up. Walk us through like the actual process. So you've mentioned a lot of things like the lead interview and, you know, you mentioned being on stage, but, you know, make us feel like we were on stage with you. What's the actual process like, you know, going through the American Got Talent, America's Got Talent uh, process? Yeah, for sure. And for people that are interested in doing it, I think um, they used to have, I, I'm sure they don't now, but uh, with everything going on, but um, they used to have like in-person auditions where like a ton of people would show up and I didn't have an agent or anything. I think one year, I think the year before I I just showed up to that and it was kind of a tough situation for a comedian because there weren't really audiences. And I think there were just a few people and watch a couple of people watching who like, I don't know how much their decision power was, but then the following year I had like a clip that I thought was pretty good where just the audience and it was like such a good crowd. And so it made me look good. So 
I send a short clip and from there they I think talked to me over the phone and ended up booking me for it. So when I first did the show, I think they just scheduled the time to like fly to St. Louis and um the judges were gonna be taping at the Fox Theater, which I think seems like two or three thousand, I don't know, but um but it was like a really beautiful theater. It was definitely by far the biggest place I'd been in at the time performing wise. And so I was definitely nervous about that. But um but yeah, I think they like fly everyone in like the day before. So they gave me like um I don't think the show paid a lot because um I guess you're competing for like a large cash prize if you win. But um but they give you like a nice hotel and um I think some money for food and things like that. And then I think my call time was like something really early, like uh seven AM or something. And um, <laughs> Can you even do comedy that early? I normally would not be awake that early, but, or, I mean, yeah. Uh, I, that's sometimes when I go to sleep, actually. Um, right. But, uh, but yeah, so I felt like I, I was probably, like, really sleep-deprived, but I, I think they, like, gave me a ride to this venue. There's, like, some kind of holding area with all the acts hanging out, and that's where they, like, interview you and get you ready for the show. And then... Um, I think there's like a backstage area where you talk to like you do other kind of interview type things with the hosts. And I remember like waiting to go on. You're like kind of in the wings and you just hear like the one or two acts before you. And it was kind of scary, you know, because like I had only been doing like these really small venues. Um, I was doing I had done like maybe one hour long set or two at the time. But like a lot of the show and like other stuff on the road, mostly like featuring at the time and occasionally had buying stuff but but a lot of the time I had gaps where I wasn't getting booked that much and I was just doing open mics basically so it was like weird to go from like doing an open mic with a few comedians to like this huge thing and then know that a lot of people would see it and I'd been like so focused on comedy the last few years and like this might be my first impression which might not necessarily go well because like I remember hearing the people performing before me and like some of them were literally right before me, like getting booed. And like, I think judges were pushing the, the buzzer and like, I think Howard Stern had just joined and he was like, had this reputation of like being really harsh and everything. So I was, I mean, I was super nervous. Yeah. And then it was just kind of a blur. I think I went out, went out there and just tried to uh, do my best to um, (laughs) be in the moment and say the material and i think i I definitely felt like very emotional after it went well um and was over because uh it was just such a relief where maybe also from being exhausted i felt like i was almost gonna cry but anyway it was uh yeah so it was over like by the morning i think we actually taped more interview stuff after i performed and so some of the stuff like if people watch on youtube or wherever it's some of the stuff i say in the interview or maybe all of it was actually taped after but there's a lot of things like that with i think reality tv that are a little more staged than they appear and so just to like maybe play up a certain angle, like to do a Susan Boyle type thing with certain people or try to make it unexpected um, how they do. I remember, um, yeah, just being so relieved afterwards. So I think by the time I got out of there, it was still like daytime and uh, it was weird because, you know, I was used to not even getting my day started until like usually comedy at night or maybe working an occasional part-time job at the time. But yeah, so I think I was just so relieved and um, ended up really um, just like, taking like swimming in the pool and just being relieved and also it was kind of weird because i i didn't i think i like couldn't announce it yet so it was just um i felt like very happy after that first one but also yeah i felt like i it was just very stressful <laughs> leading up to it in the whole right. process but uh which i i think some of that was just me putting extra anxiety or pressure on myself but um but yeah so just a very surreal um the whole thing uh, it was a serial several months, I guess, the whole process. But um, yeah, and then each round uh, was a little different. But yeah, Vegas was that was exciting, and um, all of them were pretty nerve wracking. And um, I guess the one I was probably least nervous about was the last one, which uh, is probably was probably why it didn't go as well. So uh, so um, yeah, it was just kind of a lesson for me to just never uh, assume anything's going to go well and. Um, there's so many things that don't go how we want them in comedy for everyone. So it's just kind of something I learned, especially around then and before and since then, I guess. Well, let me ask you this, uh, just for clarification, 
the the set that you're referring to is that the one where you win on stage in that blue suit yeah yeah so here's the thing and this is what i find interesting it's yeah. interesting to hear that to hear that this is you know the story that you chose that you struggled with because i've seen that clip i i you know um so just for for background um i've worked like i said i've you know i've worked with jacob before and sometimes when you work with comedians, like a, a very common uh, advertising thing that you'll do is you'll find clips and, you know, and, and use them for uh, promos. So I've seen the clip and I, I personally didn't walk away with the impression that it was bad at all. So it's interesting to hear that, that from your perspective, you felt it didn't go as well as it could have. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. I think I've heard other people say that, but it's good to hear it again because uh, I guess, um, yeah, I think I've watched it and been like, okay, that was not really that great. Uh, but I, I guess at the time, um, yeah, I kind of bummed out that I, I got so uh, caught up in it. And I think in my head, I might have exaggerated how badly it did. I mean, I will say this. I will say this. Uh, I have, you know, you are a lot more fluid now than you were then. And, but that, that just comes with being on stage and feeling a lot more comfortable and developing new techniques, you know, as, as you go on. So I do see those differences. But the set within itself, yeah. I don't think it's inherently bad at all. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, I mean, there were a lot of factors. I guess I was performing in um, Newark, New Jersey, and that I guess that, spe- that specific crowd especially um, just was maybe not into like that specific material or my style. But at the same time, I, yeah, I felt like I just maybe didn't quite um, deliver it at, in the way I wanted. And yeah, I even look at my set, which was in the same uh, theater before that on there. And even that one, I think the crowd was, the quality was about the same where like when I'm listening to it, it whether it's not mic'd as well as it could have been or whatever, um, like it's kind of like hard to hear a lot of big laughs. But at the same time, like I think I just sold that material more or like delivered it in a better way. And so. I think one of the judges said I was like the best act of the night after that. But in terms of the audience reactions, I guess it wasn't too much different. So I guess it's kind of a lesson for me in terms of just um, a lot of bombing is maybe just uh, in your head in terms of like, yeah. Um, how you feel like it's going or like you c- or like learning how to sell stuff, even if you don't feel like it's getting the type of reaction or the, is the right fit for that crowd or whatever so and i don't mean to take anything away from your experience at all i was just you know offering a different experience but let's get into i guess the other side of this if you could change anything about this story what are the things that you would change how would you retell the story how would i retell the story you mean in terms of like if i could change the events in the story if you could change any facts you wanted in the story what would you change like that's what i'm trying to figure out oh sure yeah i mean um yeah i guess especially at the time i would have liked to have uh just maybe delivered that material better and felt like more proud of it um but then also um even if it had gone how it did um i wish i'd yeah maybe gotten over it quicker and that kind of thing um and then yeah i don't know i guess there's not a lot i would change overall because it was all like ultimately like such a great learning experience and um in my mind one of my like most disappointing things i've done but at the same time um i felt like a lot um stronger afterwards having like kind of reflected on it or tried to like come up with better material or just uh gotten better at delivering stuff which, you know, I can still have a bad show at any moment. Like, you know, it's the comedy is so unpredictable where right. I never want to take it for granted. But at the same time, I feel like I've learned so much since then. And um, I guess there's like, in some ways, there's not a way to like have any shortcuts in learning that. So um, there have definitely been times where I thought like, oh, maybe I did this before I was ready. Um, but at the same time, if I hadn't done it, I might not have gotten to do a lot of other things that it kind of led to and that I was able to do without having agents or anything at the time. And so, um, so yeah, overall, I guess, yeah, there's not a lot of a change. Um, I am still a little embarrassed <laughs> what if I saw that clip, but at the same time, it's like probably not as bad as I made it out to be in my mind at the time. And I'm 
I've put out a lot of other things since then that I'm super proud of. And I'm really excited about a lot of material now that I haven't necessarily put out anywhere other than live shows and stuff. So, um, yeah, so at the moment, um, I don't know. Yeah. It was just, uh, I think in a way it was, it was almost a good thing. And maybe I guess ultimately, I certainly didn't look at it that way then or whatever, but in terms of like just being a really humbling experience, I feel like I, um, you know, everyone has to deal with probably failure at some point in some way. And so it's, um, you know, hopefully something I'm able to (laughs) deal with quicker, like the more it's happened now in other ways. And so that's just, I realize that's just kind of a, I think someone I heard one time describe comedy as like a cycle of failures where you get excited about something and then there's always like things that might go wrong here and there. So, um, so I'm hoping by now, um, I've gone through so many of those that it's like, uh, you know, I can hopefully just, um, move on quicker in terms of like taking a lesson from it, but not kind of beating myself up about it. Um, but yeah, I've had, I've had plenty of other things since then where I was like really frustrated about you mentioned uh, one of the things that you did mention is uh, you said that on one hand, you know, you felt overconfident and it seems like you f- wish like you had prepared more, but you also did 23 different shows. So give, knowing, having the experience and the knowledge that you have now, is there anything you would have changed in terms of your specific preparation for this set? Yeah, absolutely. Um, cause I, like I said, I think my first set, it was actually kind of almost beneficial that I wasn't able to try it out in like a great, comedy club which i would have liked to do or something i just didn't know anyone there and so in a way it was actually worked probably in my favor to test it out under the ter- toughest circumstances and so i would have i wish i'd done more of that and like as much as i did prepare in terms of I, doing a lot of stage time in vegas in front of uh, crowds there and in new york in front of really good crowds there um i wish i would have maybe done a little more um in front of like seeking out tougher audiences, which um, is important too. And so like, had I done maybe some open mics or other just tough rooms that I intentionally planned for, I think that might've helped. And then I think I also had a friend I had run the other sets pass over the phone who I think gave me some good notes on like pacing and was like a buddy who was into comedy in college that I knew. And I think he was just maybe out of the country at that time. And so that was another thing, a little thing that might've helped just in terms of like having little, a little like coaching type tip from a friend that I wasn't able to get before the last one. So that even something like that might've made a big difference, but I think it actually, yeah, that experience did kind of help me in terms of um, learning how to prepare more. And at the same time, do your best with whatever preparation, not be stressed about not having enough preparation and just doing the best no matter what. But like, for example, like when I was um, getting ready for my special and album taping last year, um, I think I am really happy with how that turned out. And a lot of that did come from a lot of putting a lot of effort into it, leading up to it and at the actual show. And so, so I did like a lot of hour sets in places that weren't necessarily ideal, that were just random towns and maybe small crowds sometimes. And uh, different things, but, but having, um, like intentionally like finding a time when I could do it and I could really just try to do as many long sets as possible and like really sometimes weird venues (laughs) leading up to it. I think that was super helpful. And I got really lucky that by the time I did it, that I'd gotten to work on it a lot in a way that's sometimes hard to find the stage time to do. And I also got lucky that the crowd was so good and a lot of, um, friends and fans or I guess, or I don't know if, there were fans, but a lot of good people showed up and to be a, not, a good audience. So let's just say, you know, you had gotten there and in your opinion, you absolutely crushed it. You know, like you just eviscerated the competition, you know, they're like, stop the show. No need for any more talent. Jacob is just done. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is what uh, Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll try to imagine that. That, that seems very unlikely that that could have happened, but thank you. you. Know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so tell me what happens next? How, like, how, do, how would that have affected you today? What, how do you think your life would have been different? Uh, well, like if I had one, for instance, I guess it'd be different cause I have a lot more money, but, um, <laughs> right. That, <laughs> But uh, no, but to be honest, like, I don't know if I was emotionally ready for even the amount, 
if anything, I almost feel like I was on the show too long uh, for what I was ready for. Like, there's times where I'm like, I almost wish, I, I felt like I did pretty well in the first three, so it almost would have been better to get cut out there. But even just like maturity wise, I feel like I've grown hopefully since then a little bit. But uh, but you know, it's an, I actually can also say from from uh, experience that um, there are people who, yeah, I mean the people that did. Uh, when I well, I think it was it was dogs that won that year. There were these dogs that did backflips, and it's like I can't oh, cool. compete with that. <laughs> but uh, and and I think it and it, you know and to be fair, I was also in a tough situation. I guess on that last set because I was following. I think the act before me was like a bird that was like doing tricks and flying through the audience. And um, I think I have a joke in my album about how like there was like a, I had to follow a parrot and the, like the worst part was like afterwards backstage, I was repeating my jokes and getting bigger laughs than I did. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, but that's a good question. I mean, there's like, there, I, I am so thankful for a lot of that experience and I'm a little jealous of people I met on that show who were like dancers or painters and like speed painters and all this stuff. Cause like I was talking to some of them and they seemed like so relaxed before they went on and, didn't necessarily have that anxiety, but, um, but I actually, a, a few years later, I think actually had a close friend who, well, he was my college agent actually for me and himself and one other person who ended up winning the whole thing. Wow. And so it was really cool to get to experience that vicariously in terms of just, um, you know, I'd worked with him, stayed in hotels with him a lot and, um, done the college market with him and he'd booked me on a lot of stuff. Um, and it was a small agency, literally the three of us, and he was like my agent. And so he was also just a really great guy, um, very smart and a lot of social intelligence, but, you know, great performer. And he was a magician who was uh, really amazing at what he does, but uh, great with people, great at performing, um, great at really everything and you should be great at and just a great as a person, you know. And so it was really cool to see um, him do that at uh, maybe a couple of years later at Radio City Music Hall and like blow away the judges and then get dinner with him and uh, his family and stuff afterwards at like Carnegie Deli and stuff. And it was so much fun. Um, and, uh, and when he won, I was so happy uh, because like it couldn't have happened to, you know, a better person. And he, I think, does have the groundedness and perspective to handle it. Whereas I don't think I would have been able to necessarily handle that well at the time. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I think now he's like, I, I will, I don't know what's going on during the pandemic, but he's been like headlining a show in Vegas every night. And, um, he was, but, but by the, yeah, he'd been doing all, you know, touring for many years and working on magic really well for years. And so it was like, you can, really notice when someone's put in the time and it pays off and like they also have the you know emotional ability to handle it and not let it get to my head whereas for me it felt like I was just kind of uh you know still figuring things out as a person and like a lot of social basic social skills as well as comedy and so and then I was suddenly like thrown into this really intense situation so um so I yeah so I think one thing I learned is like you know, sometimes it's better to maybe like wait a little bit until you're a little more ready, but who knows? Um, I think it, it can work out different ways. Um, but I'm so happy for that friend. And, um, and uh, I think he was the first or maybe only magician to win and is just a really nice guy and was my first college agent and only had to quit being my college agent because he got busy once he won the million dollars and was <laughs> buying it. Exactly. Every night. But, uh, but I'm still uh, friendly with him. He's awesome. And so, um, yeah, so I think, uh, I don't know. I, I think that stuff can. Let me, let me ask you this. Yeah. Did, you, did you feel like you had imposter syndrome when you were going on or when you go, going through the process? Oh, imposter syndrome. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I have that still, I mean, all the time, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, most of the stuff I've done, um, I feel that way, if it, especially if it's like a, one of the bigger opportunities I've gotten to do or something that feels big to me. And so, um, yeah, I have that all the time. I mean, even talking to like comedians now that I think are super funny, I'm like, oh man, they're going to think I'm a hack or like they're going to really hate my, they're going to think I'm too corny or something. So, 
Um, yeah, I certainly was like worried about like, oh, I, why am I getting this opportunity? I don't know if I'm deserve this. I don't know if I can like deal with this type of pressure. I'm like, they're going to find out I'm just like an open micer with like lame jokes or something, you know, but, uh, no, I have like a ton of that self doubt all the time. I think around that time I did start reading the artist way, which in general helped me a lot. And, um, the big takeaways for me from that, which I've tried to incorporate since then. And I was like, not totally consistent with at the time, but since like the last few years have really helped me. We're just kind of like journaling three pages in the morning and then going like doing something for fun for yourself each week. And I think that stuff has helped a lot with my just trying to stay grounded and have um, perspective and be happy and stuff. Okay. So first and foremost, uh, I want to thank you again uh, for coming on to the show. We like, uh, I'm sure the revisionaries are really going to appreciate that you were willing to be so open and vulnerable and share your story with us. Um, before, so we have, I have a tradition here on the podcast. I never tell people before I bring them on that this question's coming, mostly because I want a genuine response. Don't worry. Don't be nervous. Okay, no problem. I'd like to end it by asking, uh, could you tell us a quick story or about a quick moment from your childhood that always brings a smile to your face? Well, um, I was talking about, in this story I told today, I was talking a lot about comedy and being on stage. And I think maybe one of my first experiences with that was like in grade school um, in terms of uh, not doing comedy, but just like being in plays for the first time. Um, There were like a few plays that were like so much fun in grade school. And um, for instance, uh, I think there was a play called like Ariadne at Noxos, which was like, I want to say a Greek play. (laughs) Um, And uh, I, and I was in maybe third grade or something. I don't know. Um, but I got to play this like kind of, I think one of the lead roles. I, I mean, I hope it was cause there were only eight kids in my class. It was very <laughs> small. But uh, so it's one of the role. I don't know, but I got to play, I think this guy Theseus who was like in that story, maybe like a Greek hero or something. And um, I had this like cool dramatic entrance where I felt I, I didn't even come in until the second half, but I think my character had been kind of like hyped up the whole like all the other characters were like, oh, this guy's going to come and save the day. So I, I, it felt like so cool, uh, even though I was just playing a character and it was like not that many lines. It felt like such a fun experience to like uh, get that type of attention from the crowd. And um, and afterwards, you know, like other kids like were talking to me and stuff. And it just felt like um, maybe one of the first times where I was, I was like, oh, wow, I really want to be on stage. And I ended up, you know, not doing it officially till college stand up just because it was like I was so nervous and ended up being you know having a lot of social anxiety and stuff but but yeah I think stuff like that early on or even in grade school of writing short stories for my friends I would write like make up my own stories with like Sherlock Holmes type stuff or Star Wars characters or like uh Godzilla type like mutated alligators taking over city and stuff like that and just trying to entertain my friends by like writing or acting at that age and like making short movies as well, making stop animation movies of my action. Fig- I made like a half hour stop animation movie oh, in middle cool. school of just my action figures fighting each other. I just move them frame by frame and like do these elaborate fight scenes. And that was, um, all of that stuff was, uh, yeah, such a, such a, definitely a good memory in terms of like my first kind of experiments with just uh, doing stuff that was creative and the fact that I get to now, I guess, do that for a living and, and it's still so much fun in terms of like coming up with jokes or coming up with whatever. Um, I feel so lucky that I'm basically like still kind of doing what I love doing as a kid, just kind of making stuff, trying to make people entertained in some way, even though, that you know, I think only just five people like my family might have watched that half hour video that took me like three summers to make but it was just like a fun experience um and then doing like short story contests in middle school and like getting really into that and stuff so um and making short films and acting in high school so I guess all of that stuff was just um a good experience I think when I was super super young I was actually like I was an only child but I had a there was a friend over and we were making like these candles and I think um, I got jealous that my mom was like paying attention to him. But then I like 
that was like, I, in order to like get attention back, I think I like made this kind of like layered candle design of like a jack-o'-lantern and stuff. And right. I remember like that caught her attention and she was like, oh, that's so cool. And I was like, just on a very small level when I was maybe three or four or whatever, like I was like, oh, oh, wow, I can like do something, uh, art, you know, just kind of creative or, or I don't want to say artistic, but like something, um, and like get attention for it. That feels good. And then I ended up, uh, being a little bit of a class clown where I would do like Charlie Chaplin type physical stuff in first grade and like, just try to make my friends laugh and probably be really annoying to the teachers, unfortunately. But, um, but eventually, yeah, I hopefully learned to channel that into more productive, uh, less annoying stuff. So all of that, I guess that's a long answer, but, um, but yeah, I have a lot of good memories of just, uh, those are like earlier versions of, um, what turned into like, I guess the type of things that I hopefully use when I'm writing jokes now or just that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you again for uh, coming. Uh, do you have any uh, last words for uh, the revisionaries before I let you go? Um, sure. No, I, uh, this was a lot of fun. I hope, uh, people enjoyed it. I hope I wasn't too, uh, boring or anything, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but no, this was super fun. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, a lot of the stuff I haven't thought about in a long time. So it was nice to, um, reflect on other stuff that's happened and, uh, it's always great talking to you. So I appreciate you having me on. All right. Well, take care, Jacob. Thanks. Take care. I want to thank all of you for listening, as always. And I also want to say thank you to Jacob for uh, being willing to come on uh, this episode and be very vulnerable and open up and tell us about the challenges that he was facing while recording that set. Like I mentioned uh, during the call with uh, Jacob, I've watched the set that he's referring to, and I personally thought, you know, that it went fine. I, I didn't see any issues, but I can see how someone who is as accomplished as Jacob and is a as hardworking and a bit of a perfectionist could uh, find fault with what was going on. And also, I was not there with him on the stage, so I can't speak to how he was feeling. So I appreciate that he was willing to open up and let us know what the thoughts were and what the process was like for him as he was going through those experiences. Ultimately, it seems like from our conversation that it worked out for him. So I'm very glad that this ultimately ended up being a positive experience in the long run. But again, I'm very appreciative of Jacob. Also, one of the other traditions that we have on this podcast is at the end of every episode, we try to highlight a charity or an organization. Usually, we let our guests pick something that they're very passionate about, or I'll just select something that is somehow related to their story. For uh, this particular episode, Jacob Williams is actually very passionate about uh, the free and fair elections. So he has selected uh, the organization Fair Fight. Now, what Fair Fight does is they promote uh, fair elections in Georgia and around the country, and they encourage voters to participate in elections because they want uh, voters to be educated about their voting rights and have an awareness of and be able to advocate for election reform on all levels. So this is something that Jacob is very, very passionate about. He wants to highlight it, especially with everything that's currently going on in the United States. So please feel free to look into it and uh, go ahead and support uh, this initiative. Uh, As always, I will drop the uh, link down in the description so you can go ahead and find it. And uh, as always, I want to thank all of you for listening. This is the Revisionary Podcast.